Turning now to our panel, Wall Street Journal senior political correspondent Molly Ball, Democratic strategist and CEO of consulting firm SKDK, Doug Thornell, and Sarah Chamberlain, president and CEO of Main Street Partnership. Thanks to all of you for being here at the end of what has been a very difficult week for everyone. So thank you, Molly. Let me start with you. And let's just talk about President Biden's response because this is an area where he is quite comfortable foreign policy. This was also one of his key campaign promises, really restoring America's strength and stability on the world stage. What do you make of his response so far? Well, it is very interesting to see it, you know, praised by all of these Republican candidates, right? I think it hasn't been true for a long time in American politics, the old idea that politics stops at the water's edge. Uh, but American support for Israel is probably the closest thing you will still get mm. uh, to a unifying issue between the parties. And uh, the exception to that, of course, is, is Donald Trump, who has always bet uh, that no matter what the position is, his voters always uh, hate the Democrats more than they hate our enemies abroad um, or love our allies. And so that is what he's betting on here. And he's taken this very exotic position that you see him being pretty much universally condemned for. Sarah, it's so interesting because how many times have we had this conversation? Right. Donald Trump has said something that a lot of people find to be completely outrageous. It doesn't seem like it's going to impact him in the primary with his core supporters but is there a potential impact if he were to win the nomination? And the fact that it highlights this stark divide in the Republican Party, this isolationist wing that is really led by Trump. So Trump, you're right, it's probably not going to hurt him in the primary, but in the general, it, it's a deadly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, there's a lot of Jewish people that have voted for Republican and actually have voted for him that are unhappy. His own family is, part, is Jewish. So it's shocking to me that he would do this. I think he made this very personal and uh, doesn't care for the prime minister because he came out and called uh, Biden the president-elect. So I think it's personal, and I think that people in the general are going to start to move away from Trump even more. Doug, Sarah's saying it's deadly in the general election. What do you make, though, of the response that we've seen from his GOP rivals? I mean, this is arguably some of the strongest condemnation that we've seen from a Nikki Haley, from a Ron DeSantis, from a Tim Scott, for that matter. Yeah. And it's, you know, if you're going to run for president in a primary, you have to prosecute a case against the front runner. And they have mm -hmm. all been unwilling to do that. It looks like they're trying to get in a little guts here in terms of calling him out. But the reality is, is, you know, I think they're still trying to figure out how to do that. And foreign policy and national security within the Republican Party these days is not what it was 12 14 years ago. And, you know, one of the things I will say about this week and about Biden's speech is that it was one of his best moments, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Forceful, strong. I think if you read a lot of the Israeli publications, there was a lot of praise for that speech. A lot of people watched it. Um, it was that leadership moment that right now Donald Trump and I don't think any of the other Republican candidates for president have been able to meet. And so it was a really important moment for the president. I think it was an important moment for um, this country. It was an important moment for Israel. Yeah. One of the messages we heard from the president was to Congress, Molly, which is asking them for, quote unquote, urgent action on the issue of giving aid to Israel. We know that that's going to be up for discussion once they have elected a Speaker of the House, but apparently we're now just learning that they are going to break for the weekend. Jim Jordan won the votes in his conference, but by a very narrow margin. I mean, do you think he'll get the speakership? How does this end? Uh, nobody knows how it ends, <laughs> including Jim Jordan, including the entire House Republican conference. But yes, just as we were beginning this panel, they were being released for the weekend to try to go home and cool off. So we were about to edit, head into week three without a Speaker of the House at a time when, you know, unfortunately for everyone involved, you do need a functioning House of Representatives in order to do all to meet all these very urgent needs uh, to provide the aid that the administration is asking for to Israel, to provide the next tranche of aid to Ukraine. Uh, and in only about a month, to keep the government funded. So while the House is busy just completely falling apart in a giant flaming ball of chaos, uh, there, there needs to be a speaker so that they can do all these things. Yeah, I mean, Sarah, I was asking Matt Gates last weekend why he did this without a plan. And I wonder if the timing of this has even caught him off guard, that it's lasting this long and now this urgency, given this crisis in Israel that no one could have foreseen when this initially un unraveled. So the Republican Main Street Partnership has 90 members. 
and they're tired. And mm. they don't they no longer care if Matt Gates <laughs> what Matt Gates thought when he did this. They are tired. They want to get this resolved. I'm actually thrilled that they're going home, having spent a lot of time with them last night. And I think maybe if they get to go home, sleep, relax, spend some time with their family, that maybe when they come back next year, we can get or next week, we can get this resolved. But you're right, the vote was not close. L let me for just Jordan. ask. Let me just ask you though. I mean, I've been talking to Republican sources. They're worried this is going to cost them control of the House. I mean, is that I'm what sorry. you're hearing? Very concerned. And the 17 of the 18 members that live in Biden districts are members of the Republican Main Street Partnership. We do not have Santos, um, but they're very concerned. I mean, you see chaos down here, and most people don't understand there is no bills you can bring to the mm. floor. They can't do anything, so President Biden called for that, but the reality is nothing will be done in the House until we have a speaker. Yeah. Doug, realistically, do Democrats jump in to save this situation or no? I don't think that's... I, I think it's the job of the Republicans to pick the speaker. Uh, that's the... It's the... They are the party in charge. So of the there's House. no scenario you think where Democrats say this this has just gotten beyond the point of no return. We've got to jump in here and help just bring stability. Well, the next vote will be for Speaker, so yeah. I would be surprised if you have House Democrats not supporting Hakeem Jeffries. He's got universal support, right? So it's really the job of whoever that nominee is to gather all that support. And to Sarah's point about the challenge of Republicans face in the House. They're losing their best fundraiser in Kevin McCarthy. Mm -hmm. You know, if they go with uh, Jim Jordan, is that going to be someone who can go into 18, these 18 districts that Republicans represent that Joe Biden won? I mean, is he really going to be able to campaign in some of those places, given his positions on, 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 on a lot of issues? So, yeah, it creates putting aside all the terrible optics that exist. There are some structural and process things that are going to happen here with a new speaker that are going to be really costly for Republicans. Sarah, what about that? It will be costly, but... At what point do the Democrats say, OK, there's three, four of them willing to walk off the floor to get, to make a new speaker for the Republican Party? I mean, I think some of them have buyer's remorse for not doing it a couple of weeks ago to save Kevin, because really what this comes down to is it is the Biden's administration and Joe Biden has to run for president. Molly, so. very quickly, what is your reporting around how much concern there is inside the Republican Party about this potentially costing them? The majority. There's quite a lot of concern. I've been on the Hill all week reporting on this chaos that's unfolding. Today, I believe it was uh, Steve Womack from Arkansas said, you know, the American people gave us the reins to the House, and I would not be surprised if they look at this and decide to take it back. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, we are still covering this Congress in a state of paralysis. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.